Hey, welcome back to The Urban Monk. I am here with a special treat today. Uh, this doesn't happen very often, um, but I actually have an elder from my Taoist tradition, uh, Dr. Tom McCombs here, who's kind of like my, my great uncle in our tradition, uh, studied with my Sifu or my Kung Fu master, uh, and uh, have since, you know, we've obviously, you know, run some miles together now. Uh, and uh, he is an osteopathic physician, also, you know, kind of one of the senior students of our Grand Master, uh, came up in the ranks. Uh, you know, before my, my young scrappy ass even showed up. These guys have been doing this for 30 years and uh, has been holding it down, has been holding down the tradition and helping patients on a daily basis. Still got his hands in the dirt, doing the work, and uh, we're going to get into a lot of the esoteric stuff here. So Dr. Tom McCombs, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Good it is great you. to see you. It looks like it's cold where you're at. <laughs> it is. It is. I'm, I'm snugged up and warmly dressed for it. Yeah, great, great. I know I had the, um, uh, yesterday I, I had two back-to-back -back shows in studio, and our studio gets cold. Um, it, it gets warm in the summer, cold in the winter. It's just not an insulated, it's like a huge kind of warehouse thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Man, my feet were like blocks of ice by the end of the show. So I was just like, yeah, I'm time for some tea. Yep. So uh, I would love to just kind of intro you to my audience a little bit, just to know how you got into all this stuff. Um, how did you find the Taoist stuff before the medical stuff? Uh, same time, different different order. How to go? A uh, decade and a half before the before the medical stuff. Uh, I found the Taoist stuff in the mid 1970s, when Bill Helm got me to uh, attend a class of John Davidson, one of Cher Lu's senior students, who was traveling down to San Diego from Los Angeles. It's like, okay, this is it. I found it. This is, this is what I want to do. What was it about, what, what made it it? Like, how did you know when you walked into a class talking about some esoteric, weird Chinese stuff that this was for you? It was the experience of the energy circle. Mm. When, when, we're all, when we're all hands above hands in, in a circle around the room, and John is moving the energy, it's like, okay, this is what I've been waiting for. I had been feeling an itch that was unscratched in regular martial art training. I had trained, trained with Bill in... Uh, in Okinawa and Shore and Rue, and it, it opened up some parts of my soul that wanted more ventilation, but did not provide that. Huh. And and Taoist, the Taoist Kung Fu did. So what is this energy circle? Can you explain what, what happened that day that, that kind of rocked your world? Okay. So all the, all the participants are standing or sitting in a circle, each with their left hand palm up and their right hand palm down, hovering with the uh, one next to them. So everybody's got one hand over another, okay? And then John would move the energy clockwise and counterclockwise and raise it and lower it, and it was very palpable. You'd feel it, you go, okay, this, this guy, yeah, this is it. Something's happening here, yeah. Yep. And boy, did you not know what you were getting into <laughs> years of practice later. So the Taoist internal alchemical arts, um, uh, very few people know about this stuff, right? I mean, it is, you know, A, the Cultural Revolution in China kind of buried a lot of uh, information with yes. people. Um, and B, you know, it's just, it, it's not really in the kind of popular culture here in America. So what, let's, let's kind of get into what the Taoists thinking is and how they even kind of go about looking at energy. Okay, so Taoist thinking about energy is that it pre-exists matter we formed around swirls of energy that were here before us and our physical form has congealed condensed around around an energetic pattern that, that's the thought there but in Taoist internal alchemy we are going face to face with our inner world and we are engaging the tools of energy to shape our own energy in a very meta reflective way that that uh, turns your spirit turns your spirit in some nice directions so you have practices that help kind of drive and direct the flow of your internal energy and direct and maybe correct if we're uh, you know kind of <laughs> uh, allowing nature to run its course sure. and in doing so then what what do we start to see Quickly, you'll see increased vitality, especially with daily practice. 
within a few months, you'll see increased attractiveness. People will find you attractive. They did not find you attractive before. It's, a, it's an odd thing, but as your energy goes, you're the mm. you're the guy they want to be with. Mm. Okay. okay. So you and uh, as practice matures, your energy will actually set a tone in the room. One of my students in Colorado withdrew from training when he would walk into a room at work and everybody's energy shifted around his. Whatever his agenda was, they, they, they were automatically following it, having reeled in their own. And he got upset at that. <laughs> he he well, stayed with the gung fu, he stayed with the fighting, but he didn't want to have that kind of power. Well, there's a tremendous amount of responsibility that comes with that power. And it's one of you know, uh, clarity, one of agency, and it's also one of, of goodwill and intent, right? And, and Lord knows you can have power without goodwill um, and do, you know, all kinds of things on this planet, but that's not the type of student we're trying to train, right? So it does. The, the universe around him bended to his, his kind of energy field and his signal. Um, I would love to get into it because I don't really get to play in this this pool that often with my guests and this is you know this is where i hail from so this is to me this is super exciting to hang out with you um let's talk about what the internal alchemy implies like what happens with this energy what happens inside of us that then allows for this stuff to start showing okay. up yep and in responding to your question i want to tie it into the earlier discussion about the facing of the shadow mm. The one we did with uh, Dr. Carl Totten. Yes. 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 Okay. So, in internal alchemy, we are dealing with two different souls that occupy our flesh at the same time. And in most spiritual traditions, they will talk about a higher soul. And there is such a thing in classical Taoism, an intrusion of spirit into the physical form that fully occupies every, every cell in the body for the entire life of the body. But that's not the only thing that's there. The other information there, the other energy there, is the, is the po. It's in, in Chinese, the po. It's called the animal soul. And... I don't want you to think of the animal soul and the shadow as, as equivalent terms. They're not. The Po, I want you to think of as the operating system that the hardware came with. This is how flesh operates. It has hungers and it has thirsts and it has drives and rages and joys and lusts and sorrows and, and, and this whole experience and expression right along with operating the liver to turn glycogen into an energy. You know? so, so all this stuff is going on, and these two birds, the Huen and the Po, the cloud soul and the animal soul, transliterated, they sit on one branch of the same tree, and they occupy you all your life. Their interaction generates all sorts of problems and all sorts of strengths. The interaction of Huen and Po can generate the shadow as a person tries to use their spiritual presence and their their cognitive abilities to satisfy their craves better get that get that lust met sooner get that get that hunger satiated more and and it is a, it is a huge mistake to use the spirit in that way the the animal soul the poet takes care of the body very very well But the biggest problem is this sense of false identity that can come up between their interaction. In Taoist internal alchemy, we're after an interaction that fuses the two together. Otherwise, you simply come to the end of your life and the two separate at death. The cloud soul ascends to rejoin the spirit it was never separated from. The animal soul simply dissipates into the earth as the, as, the, as, the, as, the, as the flesh does. Now, there are some exceptions to this. If a person dies under excruciating, intense conditions, such as on a battlefield, their animal soul 
can remain cohesive for years, decades. That's why battlefields are commonly sightings of ghosts. And, and that's the closest thing that we would have in our Western terminology to this leftover animal spirit would be a ghost. They are not sentient. Uh, they're nothing but a, a loud echo that is eventually going to dissipate. But while it's dissipating, it's still hanging around and following the habits of the emotions that used to drive the organism. The pole, or also it's called the corporeal soul, um, it will dissipate. Once, we, once yes. we've passed on, it will dissipate. It will, it will move Eventually, back yes. into the ground. And yes. there is no, it's no like kind of eternal connection to the, 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 the eye behind the eye type of thing. So it's not, it's not the part of you that is, is meant to live on. So it's the operating system of the kind of the hardware that you come in with that is needed while you're here. Yes. And it is often mistaken for the self and when people ask about reincarnation, they're wondering about that. Mm. <laughs> and that doesn't continue. You know, your, your, your particular bag full of likes and dislikes and, and preferences and prejudices is not going to be handed in, in Taoist thinking, into another life. It's, a, it's going to dissipate. Unless you have succeeded at your alchemy. Mm. If you have succeeded in your internal alchemy, the cloud soul and the corporeal soul have integrated into something that is going to last centuries to include the operating of the flesh the flesh will last centuries and the operating system lasts centuries and the spirit stays within it for centuries and to this state the Taoists call the immortal and this is a state that, that has been attained recurrently throughout uh, chinese history there's a lot of people that have trained for it and and many have succeeded we have documented cases of people that have been around for a long time that um, have been practitioners and have kind of trans, transgenerational, what's the word, transgenerational kind of eyewitnesses saying, yeah, that dude was still here. Yes. Yep. And so there's a famous eight immortals, which are kind of through Taoist lore. I'm assuming there's more. Um, how do we know? Like, how, you know, do, do we have some good verification of this? about the same that we do of saints in the Roman Catholic faith, in terms of manifestations after a presumed death, in terms of flesh lasting longer than it should, of miracles being performed. People can be taken to the, to the writings that were painted on the wall of the wine shop by the founder of our own tradition, Louis Dong Pen. But does that mean that he's immortal? Or, or does, no, does that prove that he's immortal? Right. You know, the only proof of that is in the tasting of it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And once you start doing the practice, there's something you have access to that most people couldn't yes. even fathom. And so yes. let's talk about the marriage of the Hun and the Po um, and their ability to kind of start to take us out of that kind of iterative process of incarnation and, and, and kind of give us some memory to take with us. Okay. And to do that, I'm going to use... The metaphor of metallurgy. Southeast Asia, China civilization, developed metallurgy millennia ago. And so the metaphor of taking raw earth that you have selectively mined and, and, and crushing it and, and sifting it and, and taking that and, and heating it up and so you can extract a, a liquid metal from it, and you can process this metal even further, that metallurgy can stand in as a metaphor for spiritual growth. And so, as the, the you take this raw material, all of us are raw material, and we put it in the Taoist alchemical cauldron, and we start to metaphorically heat it up. And what we want is to extract something out of it that we value and to leave something behind that we don't. And so in metallurgy, all the slag floats to the surface. And the slag is what we want to get rid of. And in the metaphor I'm using, the slag is all the junk of the shadow, all the all the repressed memories, all the icky issues, all the stuff you couldn't face. Some of it belongs to you. You earned it fair and square. Some of it is simply handed to you by fate. Mm. Just mm -hmm. here you go. 
You were born at this moment. You get this issue now. Tough. Deal with it. Everybody else. Yes. (laughs) There you are. Yes. The emphasis in Taoist practice, understanding that most of us in the monastery even are not going to attain this exalted fusion. The emphasis is on accomplishing this interaction to the resolution of the fate that we were handed. We do not want to pass from this earth leaving unresolved fate behind us. That is almost a public nuisance. It's a, it's a bit like a bit like the Gui, a bit like the ghost left over, left over fate. So one of the purposes of Taoist longevity practices is to live long enough to work it out. Mm. And another is to work it out on the meditation cushion rather than in the marriage. Work it out in the context of your practice rather than at business or in family, but, you know, to, to work it out within sacred space, where you join a long line of people who are working out their stuff in sacred space, and you can share with that. So that's a, that's a big thing, and it's a big thing um, that's, pr- that's going to be pretty resonant with my community, is, you know, stuff comes up. As you start doing this thing called life, stuff comes up. But as you start doing the the, the practice, and your your alchemical yes. practice starts to kick up some of the dust, or, or bring the, the the base metals up, or you know whatever metaphor we're going to use, um, then it's in front of us, and we have to deal with it. How do we deal with it on the meditation cushion as the yucky stuff comes up? Is there kind of a, a, a predefined methodology? Do we just quiet sit with it? Like, do the Taoists even speak to how we do this? The Taoists and the Buddhists are going to differ in their approach to this stuff. The Buddhist is going to seek the center of their mind by tracking a thought retrograde from where it came from. A Taoist is going to seek to escape from the mind by dropping out, by relaxing so much that it cannot be held on to by any thought. The thing is that as these thoughts arise in meditation, the most natural thing to do is follow them, to let them draw you into a story, to let you go into a dreamy reverie about how you were wronged and and how this shouldn't have happened and and, and what you're going to say next time. And and then, you know, another 10 minutes have passed on the cushion and you have utterly wasted them (laughs) by being drawn away from your practice. So what you have to do is you have to maintain your practice, regard it as it comes up, observe it, And that's just about it. All you have to do is watch it and relax and fall away from it. And as you do so, what happens energetically to the kind of the tentacles that have kind of bound you to these memories or this, you know, this this drama or trauma of the past? They soften. They soften. One of the very nice things about Taoist practice is they soften fate. You can have a very harsh or bitter fate, and Taoist practice can take the take that keen edge off and soften and soften fate for you. But the ideal solution is to recognize that that ain't you. The ideal solution is in meditation to recognize your original nature as it appears before you, and when you see what that is. A lot of the other issues just melt. It's like you turn the light on and the shadows vanish. I have come up with an analogy using uh, using the athlete's foot as a metaphor for a troubling condition that won't go away. And most people, when they have this condition, are going to self-medicate at first until that no longer works for them and their athlete's foot gets so disgusting they see their primary care doctor, who prescribes a good, strong antifungal that helps for a few weeks, maybe, but after a while, their, their, their fungus is back, the medication's not working, and their doctor sends them to an infectious disease specialist who takes scrapings of that fungus and analyzes it and, and, and sees what, what medications it's susceptible to and, and says quite specifically, this is the species that is afflicting you, and this is the drug that will kill it. And you take that, and it works even better than everything else you've tried for another month or so. And then you're back in the same problem, and then you see a different kind of physician who says to you, look, stop eating sugar 
<laughs> and bathe your feet in sunlight one hour every day. Come back in a month. And while you're gone, once a day, pour bleach over the floor of your shower for the next week. So none of those things specifically address the minutia of how that particular thing has infested you, but it addresses the background. It addresses the background physiology that invites that fungus to prey upon you. And yes, you shine the light on it and it dries up and dies. Mm. And mm. that's what we're trying to do in meditation is we're trying to retro reflect our awareness we're trying to turn this light around and when it starts glowing within you start recognizing what you really are a lot of these other issues melt they you, you become too powerful for them to afflict you afflict you there we go so we're actually doing a, a monthly book club with my uh, urban monk academy students and um this month we're reading the secret of the golden flower um, cool yeah and so it's all about taking the light of awareness and turning it mm -hmm. around to observe the internal state. And uh, this is a, a, a concept that is really foreign to kind of the, the Western mind in a lot of ways because this, you know, I'm praying to this God outside of me, you know, help, 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 you know, you know, give yeah. me, give me this, give me that. Um, yes, and very so, Santa Claus. You must believe and you must pray and you must be good and then you'll be rewarded, yeah. Yeah, and so the, the distinction there behind like a, a belief-based faith-based system and, a, and an experiential one, I think is an interesting one because, you know, I don't believe in qi or qigong. I experienced it and it fundamentally transformed my understanding of the universe, right? So I'd love for you to kind of tease that out a little bit and how these internal scientific, uh, you know, kind of uh, platforms give us the kind of the, the, the runway to do that. Having been raised Roman Catholic, I was comfortable with the bells and the incense and the candles and all that and all the idols in the in the various niches around the churches. That that made it a very easy thing to to tran transition in, into Taoism. But I'm not I'm not I'm not clearly answering your question. Give no, me a little so, more. So the experience versus the faith. Because, you okay. know, I have to have blind faith in a certain thing and I should have to accept it. You know, I have to like, you know, let Jesus into your heart and then you're good, right? Versus you standing there and feeling this thing for the first time going, okay, something just happened. What was that, right? And then exploring that phenomena inside yourself for the next 30, 50 years, right? Wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, the faith-based religions lose out. They lose their youth when their youth are exposed to experiential religions. And that can even be experiential religions within the Christian tradition that promote ecstasy, theolepsy, and, and being God-struck by, by divine grace. You know, that, 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 beats, that beats reciting the Ten Commandments all hollow. And it, yeah. it will draw people away from other faiths because of it. Yeah, yeah. And, and so as we start to do this work, we start to feel lighter. We start mm -hmm. to feel the progress in our ability to face the shadow. We start to feel the progress as these yucky thoughts come up. Are they gone or are they just less heavy? Like what, what, what do we start to see as we're kind of progressing along this, this platform here? More stuff comes up as you get stronger. And at first, people don't understand that. They think, oh, my God, I'm, I'm suddenly being afflicted by all this stuff dumping on me. It's only because you have expanded your own capacity to the point where you can now deal with it, and, and it has arisen. I, I find it intriguing that uh, in, in another form, a, non, a non-Daoist uh, philosophy, the thighs were regarded as proportional to the capacity of the individual. And certainly, as we train those horse stances, we seriously develop some capacity with, with, with our thighs. <laughs> we do. Certainly do. Uh, certainly do. In addition, so, so we develop the ability to, to do painful things and face scary stuff in the training hall. As you are down in horse stance, you are cultivating the same 
spiritual toughness that you are going to need to face the shadow as you are facing the senior student who's overwhelming you and pushing you back. You are going to be able to, de to develop the things you'll be able to use to face yourself. And this is why martial art training is a recurring theme in Eastern mysticism and why I do not recommend higher level alchemical training to anybody who has not put their time in the training hall. Well, and that's, not that's a bit of a, a quagmire, right? Because students now want the, the flashy, bangy stuff, right? They want the chi, they want to feel the experience. I mean, I could go to a music festival and do ayahuasca and, and, and really trip out, man, right? And, and it's so untethered from the practice that roots yes. and grounds and anchors it into a reality that, that you know, we could all agree on <laughs> versus one that... <laughs> <laughs> yes. And when our own master, uh, Master Lou, was in the monastery, he was surrounded by people that shared that agreement 24-7. They had routines, daily routines and daily practices, and they were vegetarian. Not because eating meat was evil, but because eating meat makes you aggressive. Mm. Any pig farmer will tell you that you feed pigs meat and they will they'll attack each other more. Mm -hmm. So having a supportive system is much easier than trying to do it on your own. Especially when you're coming from a faith-based tradition that looks to anything outside that tradition as heresy and is going to punish you for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we seem to be in some very intolerant times with that, right? I mean, faith is, you know, there's been a separation of church and state in America for good reason back in the day, and now it's... You know, there's there's a lot of kind of faith being corralled towards like political processes and all this kind of stuff. And you know, I've noticed this on, on some of the comment threads. You know, on uh, just some of the stuff I've seen on the internet is just people attacking each other in the name of Jesus, right? And, and so we've lost the script a lot, I think, as as well on that. You know, for me, it's if you're attacking people in the name of Jesus, you've never let Jesus in your heart. I don't get I don't get where you're coming from, but that's not that's not Jesus, right? And so um, without faith. What is this Chinese system like? Like how different is it? And how, the, how do we then couple our practice with, uh, say, some sense of morality to at least, you know, keep people doing the right things and not, you know, killing each other? Okay. Grandmaster Liu had a very interesting expression. I not believe nothing. I see it. I not believe nothing. <laughs> he had no faith in anything. And yet he dealt with a number of non-physical beings who include the founder of our tradition and has, 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 de has had dealings in the spirit world. So he's not approaching it from a matter of belief. It's approaching it from a matter of, matter of experience. Generally, if, if this is the right path for someone, as soon as they encounter it, they will take to it like a like a, a, a baby seal raised on dry land takes to water. Okay, I can, I can swim now. I, mm. this, is, this is it. This is, this, is, this is what I needed. The background discipline required for the spiritual journey cannot be obtained in taking drugs and, and getting naked. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, or, or sitting around in a shaman circle out in the wilderness and evoking powers that are quite real that have no particular interest in your well-being or not. The spirit world is quite real, and it requires a warrior's conditioning to walk into it and endure it and deal with what you bring into it and return with. Yeah, yeah, not for the, not for the, the weak, not for the faint of heart. Which is one of the odd things in, in China is not, the, the Taoists are not speaking to a congregation. They're not holding services where everybody is lectured on how they ought to be and, and they are doing all practices together. No, the, the, the Taoists are living in religious communities or living within the village as a religious person, and they're taking care of the energy of the area. But people aren't coming to weekly services. One of the things the Chinese people loved when Western Christianity arrived was weekly services and him singing with the family. That was, that was so cool. Mm. <laughs> they, they, ate that, they ate that up. But, it, it, but Taoist practices were not for everybody. It was, it was unlike the faith-based practices which are being offered to the entire world. You have to believe this. You have to do it this way. And the Taoism, no, no, I don't think, I don't think you should do that. <laughs> you, 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 all, you, you come back in a few years and we'll talk about that. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But do the work, or else there's yeah, nothing to really work. talk about. So in the context of shadow work, as we yes. look at this kind of alchemical fusion of Hun and Po, of the corporeal and ethereal souls, um, how can we feel that our progress is happening? How do we feel like um, you know, the, the practice is furthering us? Okay. If you practice meditation without visualizations, without mantras, without uh, imagining a ball of light going up your spine, that kind of thing, if you're just retroflecting, imagine that you are looking at the screen on which the movie of your own life is playing. What color is that screen when the movie's off? Hmm. When the story is not being narrated, when the characters aren't striding across it, what is the background color of that screen? And that is the alchemical journey from lead into gold. Because if the first time someone looks back there, they don't see that much, because there's not that much to see. And as you develop in your training, your inner radiance develops, and you start looking backward, and you see light, and that light brightens. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the documents that Lu Dung Bin uh, from Trans Channeling uh, transmitted was that eventually you're sitting like you're sitting in gold mesh. Mm-hmm. That's the that's the secret of the golden flower. That's the that's the lead in the gold, and that's how you can tell where you are is by retroflecting and and checking in on the inner ra- the inner radiance of the inner world. So for someone who is trying to do that right now, um, as we're sitting here talking about it, how does one? Okay, so where's the screen of the mind? Where is there a, is there a location? Are we am I in my third eye? Like I want to get a little specific. I people people are going to try this. Yeah, behind the brow. Mm-hmm. behind the brow. So so when you close your eyes in meditation, in our sect, you turn your gaze to the tip of the nose as the eyes close. And that's really the first step of retroflexion. You're watching yourself. Okay. And that that motion is going to is going to help turn turn everything around, turn your awareness back into you. And, and then you have to sit and you have to wait. And that's very difficult for for any any human being, especially a westerner. To sit and wait. Well, where's my show? Where's the where's where's the movie that where did I, I paid my ticket to get in here? What's what's going on? Well, you don't know yet because you haven't been sitting and watching long enough. But if you sit as quietly as a hunter sitting, waiting for a creature to emerge from its hole, the creature that's going to emerge, you sit quietly long enough, is your original nature. And there you are, face to face with your original nature. And that that is that is the that is the experience of Taoist eternal alchemy that I would want everyone to have. I would like everyone to sit long enough to see that. Yeah, sitting long enough is is really the challenge at hand here, right? Because everyone's so damn time compressed. Um, yeah, but I mean, how many hours a, a week do your average Americans spend watching TV? and taking the attention and splintering it out into a story or a narrative written by someone else for your enjoyment or your entertainment versus finding your own essential eternal nature and, and waking up to who you are. I mean, it seems like a, an obvious choice that, you know. It is, and it, it, it comes along with a technologic revolution where you didn't make your own music either. You didn't tell your own, you know, that 100 years ago, you had to make your own music and you had to make, if you, if you were going to enjoy these things, you had to be involved in their creation, not just in sitting back and letting letting it flow into you. And, mm-hmm. and we, we've lost something there. Yeah, yeah. And so the, the Taoists, uh, Ding Ming Dao has a book called uh, Scholar Warrior. And there's this, this real kind of interesting concept of like, you know, the, 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 the gentleman or female who is, so strong in their ability to defend um, and, and be a warrior in every part of their life, but as a student of life and as a student of every element of everything that comes at them and, you know, is never giving up. And I see that in, I see that in the elders in my tradition for sure. I mean, you know, I think Carl Totten's retired nine times now. <laughs> there's just, there's more to learn, right? There's more to learn. There's more to constantly do. You know, you are actively seeing patients. You're actively working as an osteopath, working with people. A lot of osteopaths just hawk drugs, right? You're, you're kicking it old school. Talk about the people in your practice that 
you teach Qigong to versus the people who do it versus the people who don't do it, the results that you see and the difference that you see? The people that do it glow. They have moist, bright eyes. They have a moist, shiny skin. And they're, they've got a little bounce about them. They're a little bit upbeat. Yeah. That's, and it, and it really fuels recovery, important. doesn't it? Mm-hmm. It really does. I've noticed the people that took on Qigong training were the people that just got well and stayed well for the most part, um, or at least developed a culture around wellness that then became part of their operating system versus the people that said, hey, fix me, doc. You're that guy, right? Fix me. Yeah. So in context of the work that we're doing, because this is kind of like a follow-up to the, the kind of shadow story that we're kind of unpacking a little bit more. As we start to do this internal work, as we start to sit with ourselves and things come up, the instruction is to retroflect, I love that word by the way, Thank you. turn it around and sit with it and observe. Is that it? I just I want to get real specific about what the practice is. In retroflection, thoughts arise. They will, if, if, un, if they're not interacted with, if all you do is watch, the thought will rise and it will fall at about the same pace. And your ability to let go of that thought is crucial to that. Because the thought is almost a hook, a lure, that's going to pull you out of your retroflexion and pull you into the story that it's wrapped around. And you can stay in that story for seconds to minutes and then and you find yourself and you take a deep breath and get and get back to your work. So at just the ability to unhook it enough to relax and fall away gives you tremendous power and takes power away from this shadow issue. If it can't hook you and keep you, then what can? You can you can you can get away. Hmm. And as you become stronger in who you really are, as you begin the experiences of perceiving your original nature, the the, the shadow issues are almost laughable. It's like that that, that that's bothering me. <laughs> Go hmm. on, you know, you just got got to brush the stuff off. Hmm. Hmm. But you have to increase your radiance and your glow and your ability to kind of be in that place and kind of cook it in so that you can you can have a distinction and really be able to separate the the kind of the the, the light from the the darkness and be able to to really see that and experience that from a place of consciousness by relaxing by relaxing you have to relax away from the thought you have to be so cool with it that it can't stick to you mm. and you fall away from it Hmm. It's the ultimate. Uh, it's the ultimate Taoist training is relax into everything, right? Yes. And w which is, is so challenging for the Westerner. That's why this is such good medicine, right? Is because we are doers. We're a culture of doers. Everything is action oriented. Everything's like, hey, what'd you do today? What are you doing next week? And so, like, being. I mean, what the hell is that? <laughs> the dude abides. Yes, it's been, it's been a while. <laughs> the action of qigong compels the the quen and po the the corporeal and the ethereal souls to work together it compels them to cooperate and they and they and they like that and, it, and it's a good thing and the ideal state for your physical health would be that your operating system is going so smoothly there's no part of your body fighting any other part of your body at any time 30 trillion cells are in agreement with each other. No body part is spasmed in order to counterweight against a restriction on the opposite side. There's no hunching over any visceral pain because, because everything's just operating as, as naturally as it can. Mm -hmm. And that's with a practice 
that is for you. I mean, Qigong, there's a lot of types of Qigong. I mean, I've been teaching a, a number of them to our students, and you know, there's different strokes for there's, there's, there's the Wei Gong, there's the Qigong, there's the Nei Gong. I mean, specifically, we're talking here about Nei Gong, presumably, in the internal yeah. alchemical work. Internal alchemical work. Yep. And so, you know, people will see a lot of Qigong out there, which is, you know, it's great for energy, it's great for immunity, it's great for a lot of things. But when we're talking about this kind of cultivation of awareness and, and turning the light around, then we're really kind of talking about the Nei Gong, N-E-I Gong. Yes. And, and I would actually, because a lot of people don't know the distinction there, so I feel like it's on us to yeah. educate a little here. And you're starting to leave behind the world of a civilian practitioner, and you're starting to move into sacred space and sacred inquiry. Hmm, you'll be encountering the divine <laughs> if you keep going in that direction. Yes. <laughs> careful what you ask for. Careful what you ask for. It's, yeah. it's, it's been waiting for you to. Yeah, yeah. No, I love it. I love it. Um, I know we have a number of questions from the audience. I'm going to kick over to uh, Sean real quick uh, so that we can uh, handle. So, so and for those of you that are new to this format, we've moved over to Facebook Live so that our audience can actually ask my guests questions. And, and so this is, this is fun. Great. Um, so Renee has a question. He says, so the thought uh, wants to enter creation and tries to pull your cautious, consciousness to focus on it. Um, and bring it into the physical. Is that how thought works in this situation? Um, so, so Renee's question. So, so the thought wants to enter creation and tries to pull your consciousness to focus on it and bring it into the physical. So, this is a question from Renee. He just wants to. He just wants to make sure he's understanding the kind of the emergence of these thoughts correctly. <clears throat> That's close. Yes, the the thought the thought arises, and the thought is attractive, and the thought can lure you into giving that the thought and that scenario and the story all of your energy, all of your attention that should be retroflecting. Hmm. Now, if you take a candle and you light the candle flame, and the light and the heat go out, if you surround that with a reflective mirrored surface on the inside where all the light and heat hit that mirror and bounce right back and hit that wick and make more light and heat to bounce out and go right back and hit that wick. Now we're talking retroflexion and Taoist internal alchemy. Okay. But yes, the thoughts will arise. The Dalai Lama says thoughts arise. I still mm -hmm. meditate and thoughts arise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and as, and as they arise, you have to be able to watch them and let them go without being drawn into it, without analyzing it, without rehearsing your role in that story, without preparing for the next time you deal with that issue. Not, it's not what you're there for. That's you're great. There, you're there to free yourself from it. That metaphor is great. I, uh, the, the, the super Thank reflective you. kind of wrap around a candle which then, I mean, creates a sun, really. I mean, that thing will just continue to, you know, increase in light. Um, I love that. And then MK has another question. She's asking, um, do the things that come up, do they only do so in meditation or throughout your everyday life? Okay, so she said the things that come up, do, uh, do they do so in meditation or in all, in all of our kind of daily living? All of daily living, 24-7, they're the contents of your dreams. They're the content of what you're fretting about when you get up to pee in the middle of the night and can't get back to sleep. It's, this, it's, this, it's like a, a bone that your, dog, your dog's favorite chew toy and can't let go of it. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's always there. Yeah. It's always there. Meditation is your first conscious turning around to looking at it rather than the rest of life where we just have this thing going on inside of us and the noise is there and maybe we're acting in accordance with it, maybe we're not, but it's never letting us alone. Mm. Mm. But that, that, that conscious act of sitting there and looking at it will then start to reverse the direction and, and that retroflection yes. then gives us the kind of personal power to kind of wake up to our internal universe, which is... Almost been... like standing up to a bully. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. I like that. You got some good metaphors. Any other questions for Thank you? Uh, yeah, Dale has a question. So where did um, you study and obtain your Taoist training and how long did you study for, not including like life study? Is that good sure. Uh, where did you study uh, your Taoist training? Uh, Who did you study with and how long? I uh, started studying in Sherlu's tradition of in the mid-1970s. And in 1978, no, 76, 1976, I took ordination with the uh, Taoist 
sanctuary of Los Angeles. And but most, mostly it's been through Cher Lou and Dot on Five. Some work with Ken Cohen. Mm -hmm. Who's great. Who's great as well. Yeah. So Cher, and Cher Lou has recently passed. How, how old was Cher Lou when he passed? He was in his early mid 90s, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he had born a, in like 1918, something like that. Yeah. And, and he had an interesting life. I mean, they all did. These guys, you know, the, the Chinese military showed up, killed his, you know, elders and just, you know, imprisoned and, and tortured. And, you know, it, it wasn't easy being uh, of any religion when, when, you know, it hit the fan then in China. Yeah. And so these guys had to escape and get out. And I think he was the first to really openly teach Nei Gong and, and some of these kind of internal practices to non-Chinese, right? It took years yes. to get there. And, and the example of other masters in San Francisco, uh, RQE Wong started opening his teaching to non-Chinese. And, and he was such a respected master, I believe Cher Lu was even teaching out of his studio at one time. And that kind of paved the way for him to, to, to teach to non-Chinese. Huh, interesting. So he saw the, he saw the merits in, in teaching this and kind of opening up the book a little bit. And I think he also saw that China wasn't going back. China, the, the, the Chinese communist experience wasn't going to burn itself out and they turn around and invite all their elders back to hmm. replant the seeds of this ancient wisdom. He, if it was going to live as a living thing, then it had to be taught to the people that were here. And it lives in, in individual people. Yeah. yeah, that's really funny. It's very similar to kind of my lineage and that, you know, for 30 years, my parents thought they were going back to Iran because the revolution would like flip. Right. And at, at a certain point, everyone has a rude awakening, realizing that, you know, I'm sorry, those guys are kind of there to stay. And yeah, yeah, the life you thought you had is over. Um, so start your new one uh, now. Right. Um, MK is asking, uh, you know, how do we find someone to study with locally? Um, that's a that's a tough question because Dalton Pai is so rare. Yes. Yeah. So what can a person do that is wanting this type of experience and doesn't have this kind of access? The closest things that are widely available would be Tai Chi, Tai Chi training, and Zen meditation. Those are fairly well distributed in our culture, and they have the essence of the exercises that are chi sensitive, that focus on the breathing, that make you turn into your awareness very internally. Where is my weight? Where 60-40 or 70-30? That kind of, as long as you're looking on your innards, you're, you're making progress. And then Zen meditation is silent retroflexion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and Zen meditation has a lot of kind of Taoist influence from the beginning anyway. So it's kind of where Taoism and Buddhism met in China and, and, and created yes. a baby. I, ex excellent. I, I said they had an affair and, and that Zen is their daughter. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah, and Zen's done really. I mean, l listen, the the Japanese culture was, uh, you know, it, it was easier to accept. I mean, they were an ally after the war. A lot of our, you know, a lot of our troops were stationed in Okinawa. A lot of guys came back with karate, so we have a lot more access to kind of the Japanese lineages than we have yes. traditionally the Chinese. And so, you know, the, so just get it where you can. And the the other side of it is that the, the Japanese did not go beyond that. They do not have an internal alchemical tradition with the kind of exercises that we have in the way of the elixir. Mm. They, Interesting. They, they, yeah. They just, they just don't any more than they have the herbal medicine that we use to condition our hands before, before uh, iron hand practice. Yeah, you know, certain they, things didn't make it. Certain, thing, certain things didn't make it. Yeah. Taoism is a rich, rich tradition. This, this lineage that we train in is, is in 25, 26 generations now. Yep. That's cool. Yep. Yep, I know. And there's a lot of responsibility to keep it living in, in people downstream and, and keep it going because, you know, the, the temples have been burned. The ones that have been put up on, on top of them are kind of like Chinese Disneyland. And so they're, they're really kind of built for tourists, not for, not for, you know, the experiential kind of practices that were taught there for, for you know, thousands of years. Yes. They haven't closed everything down. Mount Wudong still has active temples and practitioners. They have sent a missionary to the United States. Great. Yeah. Uh, but when Mount Wudong visits, there's always official censorship and supervision to make sure the right things are said. And the, the abbot is very gracious to the government to let them come and things like that. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. He's, he's playing by the rules. 
But yes, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. Doc, yes, we're, at, we're out of time. Uh, I would love to help our audience find you and your work. I love the work that you're doing. Um, I, I, I get to see you once Thank a you. year, which is obviously never enough. But, um, you know, the more the merrier. Um, I'd love to have you on the show more, more often, too, just so we Happy can keep to. talking about this stuff. Yeah, so website, uh, your work? Is Bay Area Osteopathic. Bay Area Osteopathic. That's us. Yeah. Great. That's me and my me and my wife and boss, the good Dr. Susan Sislow. Great. Great. Dr. Tom McCombs, you're great. I, I really appreciate everything that you've done. Always, always, always. always. Yeah. Yeah. Always an honor. Uh, tell me what you think. Uh, this is obviously, uh, you know, kind of deep, provocative conversation. We're going to follow up on this, and uh, we'll have uh, the good doctor back uh, in some calls soon just because I know that there's going to be follow-up questions to this. I will see you next time. Let me know what you think of the show in the chat thread.